This is the Financially Simple Podcast, a show dedicated to destroying the complexities of money for today's small business owner. And now, here's your host, pizza-loving, certified financial planner, Justin Goodbread. Welcome to Financially Simple. This is a finance show for small business owners about money, how it works in our business and personal lives, and how we can build wealth to be financially independent. I'm your host, Justin Goodbrand, and today we're dealing with a little bit of a detailed topic. Today's episode is titled, The Principles of Valuation. Now, in episode 70, our last episode, we discussed the various types of value. And we learned there are many, many, many different types of value. So when someone says, what's the value of your company? You now can legitimately say, what type of value you're asking me about? But as we concluded in our last episode, the value that we're specifically looking to grow is what's called intrinsic value. And if you remember, intrinsic value is sometimes referred to as fundamental value, and it's the truest value based on an analysis. But after I recorded the last episode, I was asking myself, is intrinsic value really the most important item? See, I'm all the time questioning even what I say. Shouldn't we really just focus on a sales price? You know, many times we as consumers look at price in making a decision. Uh, My mom was actually talking to me today. She wants to buy a new car. Her car is old because of life events. She's like, I would like to have a brand new car. Now, we drive the cars in the good bread family until the wheels literally fall off sometimes. It's just the way we are. But she's like, in my years of living on this earth, I've never owned a new car. And ultimately, the question came up about price. What's the price of the vehicle? Now, when it comes to business, you know, many times we look at price. And if we are truthful with ourselves, many times the seller is focused on the price more so than the buyer. Of course, the buyer is worried about can they afford the business, but many times the seller is focused on it. And that's why they're looking at the price is called a transactional value. You know, transactional value comes into play with we, the sellers, who are trying to convince ultimately the buyer to write us a check, right? And so we may argue, well, check out the economic conditions right now. I mean, the market's looking good. There's a lot of headwind in front behind you pushing your sales. I mean, this is a good buy. Or we may make an argument about this specific industry we're in. We may say, you know what? Our industry is growing. It's not in atrophy. There's lots of hubbub about our business. We could say, you know, timing is perfect. We're coming out of recession. Now the economic situation is right. The price to buy the company is relatively low. Lending is cheap. We may even argue from a comparable transaction standpoint. You know, Johnny May up the road, he sold his company for X, or Sally Sue sold her company for Y, and our company is very similar to that. But that is often the approach that the seller uses. But whenever we're dealing with intrinsic value, and whenever it comes into the picture, this is more of a buyer focused. You see, the buyer's focused on things like, what's the quality of this company's operations? Is it really viable? What is the transferability of the intellectual property? Can I actually gain patent control over this? Is this business sustainable? They may ask things like, what's the strength of your bench? I always say strength of your bench. How's your management team? Are they older? Are they younger? Are they going to be around? Are they overpaid, underpaid? And they may ask, do you have one good customer or do you have multiple good customers? Do you have good relationships? Do you have operating synergies? You know, am I going to get a good long-term return on investment? And these are the questions that are more focused on value. So I ask the question, what's more important? Is it value or price? You see, Warren Buffett once said in relation to buying businesses, he said, value is what you get, price is what you pay. I think that's a relatively wise insight. Therefore, if value is what we get and price is what we pay, and we're looking at it from a buyer's perspective, then we want to build a business where the buyer sees a higher value and is willing to offer us a higher price. We've seen crazy people do crazy things. We've seen people spend lots of money on just crazy things. I can remember one time I had a friend of mine that's paid an outlandish amount of money to go to a particular football event. Like, dude, you're smoking crack, man. That's crazy. There's no way I'd spend that. But he saw the value. That's what we want our buyers of our business to do, friends. We want them to see a value that they're willing to pay a higher price. But we're at the point in our series here 
In order to understand value, we need to know the methodology to how it's determined. You know, it's one thing for me to say, hey, we got to grow our value, but what makes value grow? So in this episode, I'm going to cover the principles, the basic principles of business valuation. And in the next few episodes, I'm going to start digging deep into some meanings and some terms and some things. Now, do I expect you to fully understand how to calculate the value of your business? No way. That's ludicrous. There's no way I want you to do that. But before we can get into the details of how to grow the value of the business, we have to understand some basic principles of how valuation even works. How did the appraisers come up with the values of our company? So we need to start there. And the way to understand it is there's basically three different approaches to valuation. And out of the three, one is king. So we're going to talk about this. So let's see if I can simplify this for us in our financially simple podcast today about what is the three basic approaches to valuation. Now, each of these three approaches, we're going to have a couple of different subsets underneath this. So I'm going to try my best to explain these to where you can follow along in an audible format. Like always, if you have any questions, hey, you're welcome to reach out to me, Justin at FinanciallySimple.com. Hit me on Twitter. A lot of folks are now connecting with me on Twitter, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm, I feel like I'm everywhere out there. In fact, today, somebody quoted me on a newspaper. I don't even know where it's at. Somebody called me and said, dude, you're in the newspaper. I'm like, really? Where? So reach out to me if you have any questions. So let's deal with these multiple approaches. So the first one is going to be the market approach. And that sounds really good. You know, I want to get a market price. You know, when we go to sell a house, what's the market value of your house? That's not the same in business. So underneath the market approach, there's two common uses for the market approach. The first use is actually called the guideline public company method. And this market approach looks at comparable, and that's always the key, comparable public companies and tries to correlate them to the subject company or to the company the appraiser is trying to gain a value for. And this approach works really, 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 really good with large publicly traded companies. But it is doggone hard to compare a company that is huge on the Dow or on the S&P 500 or even on the on the Russell 2000. It's hard to compare a company of that size with a small private company or even a private mid-sized company. So for many small businesses or for many entrepreneurs, the guideline of public company method, that's not one that we're going to use because we're dealing with public companies. So lo and behold, underneath the market approach, we also have the guideline M and A. So that stands for mergers and acquisition transaction method. So this approach looks at comparable private company transactions. Aha. So this one's going to go in and try to look at companies which are private and correlate them to the subject company. So you're thinking from a terms of an appraiser. Someone is looking at trying to appraise your company. They're going to try to compare your company to other companies that are comparable that are private. And it sounds good. Here's the problem. Comparable, number one. Are they in the same revenue stream? Are they in the same location? Are they in the same demographic? Are they in the same SIC code type business? What type of company are they? And are they truly comparable? That's the first thing. The second thing, it has to deal with the word private. We're private companies. Therefore, our information is often private. <laughs> so it's very, very, very difficult many times to compare private companies underneath the market approach. So that leads us into the second type of approach. And this one is pretty easy to run these calculations. You don't have to be a rocket science or even a valuation expert to get real close on these. They're what's called the asset approach. And these two approaches require pretty detailed financial records. So there's two main asset approaches. The first one is what's called the adjusted net asset value. So the adjusted net asset value. And that's commonly used in replacement value. So if you're looking to replace the company or if you're looking to replace a loss, maybe another scenario where if you had devastation like a hurricane, there's many uses for this. That's just the one I can think of as I'm offhand here. But the way you calculate it is simple. You calculate the value of the individual assets and liabilities. But you're looking at your balance sheet and you're saying, if I were going to sell my tractor, how much can I get for it? If I'm going to sell my truck, how much can I get for it? If I'm going to sell my computer, how much am I going to get for it? So you're actually calculating the values of your individual assets and your individual liabilities as if they were going to be individually disposed of. 
You use them and you total those assets minus liabilities to get your adjusted net asset value for the company. Now, whenever we're doing replacement value, many times it's used in an ongoing concern. It's used as a floor value. Maybe it's an insurance issue. Maybe it's a litigation issue. You just never know. But many times it's just a baseline. So that's the first adjusted asset value underneath the asset approach. The second adjusted asset value is what's called the liquidation value. And liquidation is like we talked about in last episode. It's where you're going to sell or liquidate all the assets of the company in quick order. And this could be forced. In other words, a court requires it through a bankruptcy situation or some type of dispute issue, or it can be an orderly liquidation. That's the first type of asset approach valuation. The next one is what's called the excess earnings method. And this is another asset approach. And it's a little bit more complicated to calculate. Basically, you're going to value all the intangibles. So this is the method of valuing intangibles, And it's calculating the excess return on the assets. And you're calculating them to get an intangible value. So you may often use this particular calculation method in calculating like a blog or like a royalty stream. Again, it's very seldom used. It's actually just a checks. And it's rarely used for an acceptable conclusion. Many times appraisers won't even use the asset approach. You are listening to Financially Simple, destroying the complexities of money for today's small business owner. So that leaves us with the third type of valuation, and this is what's called the income approach. So it's actually taking true cash flow. In fact, the very first methodology is called the capitalized historical cash flow method. Just like it sounds, it's going to look at the average, the weighted average of the historical cash flows, and it's going to divide it by what's called a cap rate or a capitalization rate that reflects the riskiness and the expected growth. So you're looking at the historical income of the company, the historical value, the cash flows. You're going to divide it by a cap rate, by a discount rate. It's a capitalization rate, actually, that reflects the riskiness and the expected growth of the cash flow for the future. If you ever look at this calculation, it's kind of easy to understand the output. The downside to using a cash flow rate is it requires a lot of judgment in determining that capitalization rate. We spoke about a couple of episodes though of company specific risk and your company's risk actually helps determine whenever you're dealing with the appraiser what your cap rate is or what your capitalization rate is. And so there's a lot of judgment in determining the cap rate. And this is where, whenever you use the income approach, appraisers can vary on the value of the company. So that is the historical method. Then you also have, underneath the income approach, you have the discounted future cash flow method. And that's exactly what it sounds like. It's a method that values the projected cash flows of the future by discounting them to a current rate. Now, I'm oversimplifying that, but you're discounting the back to re- that reflects the riskiness of the cash flow. And it calculates the terminal value. See, the cool thing about the discounted future cash flow method is that our businesses will not last forever. At some point, the appraiser of your company has to make a decision on when the company is going to not make any income. And so that's called terminal value is what that's called. At some point, the cash flow is assumed is going to cease, and that's where this very complicated calculation compared to the historical value comes into play. Here's the thing. It requires the same assumptions by the appraiser. So you're like, dude, Justin, you just lost me. We're at 14 minutes into this podcast right now, and all I know is there's three types of valuation. If you've got that right now, thank you. That's all I needed to get across. But here's where it gets important. Whenever it comes time for you to have your business appraised, the majority of times we're going to use the income approach. In fact, the income approach is so valuable that Shannon P. Pratt, P-R-A-T-T, Shannon P. Pratt is the chairman and CEO of Shannon Pratt Valuations. Kind of catchy. His valuation company is probably the most quoted, maybe the leader in the valuation world. 
I looked him up just to kind of check on the guy, just see a little bit more about him. I've read a couple of his books, but dude, this guy has more credentials than you can even read. I mean, he literally has written the book on valuations, literally. Actually, he's written many, 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 many books on valuations. I stopped counting at 10. What Mr. Pratt said is this. He said, estimating the value of the company, he said, the income approach is king. Hands down, the income approach is king. Whatever approaches to value are used, they should be reconciled with the income approach. And at this point, you're like, okay, Justin, I get it. We have to use the income approach when we estimate the value of a company. But why does this all matter? So, you know, I saved my illustration in this particular episode toward the end here, and I wanted to kind of give you a real-life scenario on something that I've dealt with. You know, I've worked with many, 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 many business owners over the years. And in one particular situation, I had a business owner who wanted to purchase another company. They had a company, or actually had a couple of companies, and they wanted to purchase another one. And I received an estimated value from the seller of a company that, this individual was looking to buy. And I quickly reviewed the number. The seller's team had used the market approach in estimating the value of the company. They had not used the income approach. They used the market approach. And as we saw, that could have some dangers to it. See, the seller, who was interesting, it was a whole, whole crazy situation, but the seller was working with a commissioned-based broker who was just getting started in the business. So this is a young novice commissions-based broker. And my client, the buyer, was interested in the business. But this client didn't understand the valuation methodology, even what we just went over. Once I gained an understanding about the details of this particular organization, then I asked our team. So we had an expert valuation expert on our side. I asked our team to estimate the value using the income approach method. And when our team was done... We were able to negotiate the purchase price down about 50% from the market price estimated value the broker had provided. I mean, the buyer sitting here saying, I'm not paying that. He saw the income approach methodology. And remember the questions they were asking earlier. So if you're looking at it from an intrinsic value, you're the buyer saying, is the company going to be profitable? Do they have the right systems in place? Is their team going to be here? Do I have customer concentration? And they're going through all these different scenarios. And whenever we ran the income approach scenario and we looked at the risk or the cap rate and all the different nuances within the company, our buyer was not willing to pay what the seller was offering. See, the seller was looking at it from a financial perspective. The buyer was looking at it from an intrinsic value perspective. And because of this, even the seller said, dude, I wish I had understood the business valuation methods. I remember one of the first companies I sold, I can remember sitting there going, I've worked for three years and all I'm getting is X because I didn't understand how value was determined. So am I saying all that to say that you really need to understand formal valuation in your business? No way. No, 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 no. I have more credentials than many people. And I got to tell you, I'm going to be honest here. It is very difficult for me to even come close to calculating the value of a company. Why? There are very, very sophisticated software packages out there that give us a range of information. Remember the subjectivity, the appraisers looking at different things, trying to figure out what the risks are and de-risking and all those things. It's very difficult for yours truly to even try to calculate the value of a company because there's some really cool software. I'm not saying you need to learn how to do a value in your company, but what I am saying is you need to understand the various approaches. You need to understand that the income approach is king. And underneath the income approach, we either have historical values where we're looking back and we're saying, here's what the company's done, and therefore, because it's done this, it may go forward. Or we're looking strictly at the performer going forward and saying, here's the where we think it could go. How do we bring this back to current value today? And if we understand the rules of the game, if we understand the way the game is played, then we can win. Imagine trying to play the game of football or football, whichever one you want to play, either round one or the oblong one, either one. Imagine trying to play it without knowing the rules. Or better yet, try to play baseball without knowing the rules. And all of a sudden you hit the ball and run straight at the pitcher. You would never win. What makes us think that we're going to try to grow a company and try to grow it to the point we're going to sell it without knowing the rules? So that's it for this episode. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me on the Financially Simple Podcast. 
As always, show notes and links for today's podcast can be found at financiallysimple.com under the heading podcast. And I'd like to invite you to connect with me on social media. You know, I'm getting, like I mentioned earlier, I'm getting tons of questions and I'm, I'm trying to answer them all. Connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Just reach out to me. I'm everywhere. You can just about find me. If you have a particular question, I got one today. It was a great question. Shoot me an email, justin at financiallysimple.com. You know, like I say every week, life is hard. It is. Life is doggone hard sometimes. But man, life is so good. There's so much goodness around us. There's so much to be grateful for. You know what? Valuations, they can be overly, overly frustrating and complicated. But remember, money doesn't have to be. Let's continue to make our lives at least financially simple. Hey, y'all go out and create a great day. You have been listening to the Financially Simple Podcast. The information in this show is for informational purposes only. This show is not investment advice. Instead, seek help from a competent financial advisor. Justin Goodbread, CFP, is an investment advisor representative of Heritage Investors, a registered investment advisor. 